Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's study. Now, this is the study number eight in this series of the line of the judges. And this is the story of Jephthah. So this one is going to be um, packed with a lot of information, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. And some of it I have already addressed, uh, dealing with Capricar's constant. But uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Mm-hmm. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here. We ask for your angels uh, to be here in our midst, to watch over us, to care for us, and help us, Lord, to trust in you. We thank you, Lord, for this study, for the things that we have been learning at this prophecy conference. And we know, Lord, that these things are going to take time to settle in so that we can study them for ourselves, so that we can share them with others. But, Lord, we know that you are leading us, and we ask for your hand to be upon us and to be upon us in this meeting. Help me to explain things clearly and simply. Give me a clear mind, and give us all an understanding mind, a receptive mind, and an understanding heart. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we look at the story of Jephthah in the line of the judges, this is the formalization of the second angel's message. Now, in the line of the judges itself, we know that the arrival of the second angel is July 18th. When we look at the line of the judges itself, we have um, December 6th, 2020, as the formalization of the second angel. So we looked at Tola and Jair. Now that line did have December 6, 2020 in it, right? So when we zoom into a way mark on a line, we can expect to see way marks on that line being illustrated. So we don't just have a whole bunch of new way marks. And we learn that from the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that they shared way marks even though each of them has their own line. So when we zoom into Abraham, he's going to have way marks that are events in the life of Isaac, such as Isaac's birth is in the line of Abraham, but it's also obviously in the line of Isaac. So this is the case here. But when we're zooming into something like the formalization of the second angel, we know it's related to the second angel, but it's going to relate specifically to that way mark, December 6, 2020, It's going to give us more information about what that way mark means. Now, part of this study um, is about the wonderful number. That is, the line of Jephthah, when we first constructed it, um, we had it starting on June 22, 2014. That's not the line we eventually ended up with, but we still have that line in here because of the witness that it had uh, regarding Palmoni. And, um, but as we looked at it more and more, different things came to light. One of the keys was Capricar's constant. So the developing of a line, that is the understanding of the line, is illustrated here in how we came to understand the line of Jephthah. So I'm going to bring you through that process of how we, in a sense, were corrected. So when we created the line of Jephthah first, the first one that you see on on the first page of the notes for Jephthah is one that starts on June 22nd. And there's nothing wrong with this line, though I feel it's probably a zoom in to one of the waymarks on the line of Jephthah itself. So... Um, Now, what we had done is we had looked at Judges 12, verse 7. And Judges 12, verse 7 is uh, this date, and we're going to look at that. So let's go there. And 
we tried to draw out how to draw this line initially, and one of the keys was Judges 12 or 7. Now, 12 or 7, we can see that that is a symbol that we have on the 1843 chart. So on the 1843 chart, we have in the top right corner, 7 times 12 equals 84. Now we also know that we could look at that um, as the 7th verse in the 12th chapter, which would be an inversion of 217. So we understand in regarding iterations of numbers or different arrangements of numbers that they can represent the same numbers that have those iterations. And that, that one is that Jephthah judged Israel six years, then died Jephthah in the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So that, so that was where we started from. And so we looked at, well, six years. So we looked at the verse itself. Now the verse, when we use... The, and can you bring up your Bible indexer there around, please? So when we looked at the verse, and this is one of the things that we, we do with verses, and he's going to bring it up in a moment. I should have had him prepared to do that earlier. But we can see that we can count the gematria of the verse. That is, we take the letters uh, in that verse in English, and we give them a number based upon one is A, 26 is Z, Z for the Americans. And, and the reverse gematria would be Z would be 1 and A would be 26. So when we look at this verse, um, if you can bring it up, Judges 12, verse 7. It's there on the screen. And we look at the verse, it's going to say that the the verse is, uh, the reverse book verse is 252. Is that what that is saying? I always have trouble reading how this. And the sum, uh, the reverse sum is 629. So that is, in the book of Judges, this is the 252nd verse from the end of the book, right? Iran, is that correct? That 250, right, from the end of the book. And the gematria for it the reverse gematria is 629. Now, 629 is a number that comes from Modilio's study on the mandates, and it's connected to other symbolic numbers that we have, such as 911, and 273, etc. So it's, um, and to July 18th, it's, it's connected to those. But we have this reverse book verse, so it's, there's, it's the 500 or 252nd verse from the end of the book. So that gave us some indication that we could look at that, that number and we would connect it to um, other symbols. So we looked at June 22nd, 2014, and December 6, 2020, which this verse is about, and that one also symbols, symbolizes 252. And uh, so this six-year period is, um, now I don't have it written down here, but I'm going to look at it quickly. So this is starting June 22nd, 2014 to December 6th. Uh, 2020. Now, I'm trying to see if I wrote the number of days in there, and I'm not sure if the 1629 is the number of days. I don't think so. I don't think that would be the correct number of days. Uh, it's Well, it can't be because we have 2,030 days to January 11th, 2020. So I think we're just taking that six years and we're talking about the symbols that come out of that verse. But we are marking six years, so 14... Um, 220. Now, most of the verses there, or most of the way marks, are June 22nd and October 22nd in 2014, and then the other ones are all in 2020. So March 31st, June 22nd, July 18th, December 6th. I'm not going to go through this line in detail, 
But we constructed this line and we thought it made sense. And I don't think it's particular, particularly wrong, but it's not complete, right? So that's all I would say. And, and part of this is the story of Jephthah has all of these different narratives and, and many possible lines. So, but our goal was to construct a single line for Jephthah, even if many lines could be constructed. And each of these lines would merely be a zoom into a way mark on a line above. Now, where this insight came so that we could sort out this line came from the name of Jephthah. That is, his name, Jephthah, has the Hebrew number 3316. So, Jephthah... Is 3316. Now, I looked at that and that reminded me of something because I could see that if I multiplied this by 2, it would be 6632. And I know something about this number, 6333. 6633. Now, 6633 is the number of days from September 11th to November 9th. Now, I don't think most people would know that if they looked at that number, but I knew that was the case because I've dealt with this a lot. So what I did is I recognized that I could take this number, 3316, and I could get to a halfway point between November 9th. Um, so I'm going to put November 9th over here. So this is 11, 9, 19. And over here, I'm going to have 9, 11, 01, right? Could put a 1 there. But you understand what I'm saying? We have this 9, 11 and this 11, 9. And this is going to be 66,000 or 6,633. There we go, 6,633. Okay, so that's the span of time between these two. But I know that we have 3,316 and 3,316 with a date that approaches some other date here in the center. So I wanted to know, so this, if I counted here, from the end of this date, it's going to be, bring me to the beginning of this date. And if I count from the beginning of this date, it's going to bring me to the end of this date. So there's a date in between here in the center. These are supposed to be arrows pointing towards that. I could have placed them here, right? So there's going to be a date here that they're pointing to. And that date is October 10th, 2010. So instead of writing it like that, I'm just going to write it like this. 10, 10, 10. That's the center date. Now, would that be significant that we have a center date that is the 10th day of the 10th month in the 10th year on our calendar? And we would have to say yes, right? The 10th day of the 10th month is the day of the siege. It's the date that's marked by Ezekiel that he had predicted. And that when that date occurs in Ezekiel 24, God is going to tell him to note the day, write down this day, even this same day, for Jerusalem is besieged. Right? So that's the siege of Jerusalem. It's a, an important symbol, the 10th day of the 10th month. But it's also here in the 10th year in Ezekiel 24. It's in the 9th year of Zedekiah. But here it's in the 10th year, okay? So it has that extra 10 there. Now, if you think about it in Ezekiel, you could see it as 11, 1, 1, 9, because it's 10, 10, 9. If you took out the zeros, you'd have 11, 9. But... Um, I don't know if that's the most important way to look at that because we have 1010 10 as a symbol. Now, it's also the first day of the seventh month. 
that is, it's Rosh Hashanah, right? So again, very significant date. We keep running into this first day of the seventh month as part of these structures. Now, uh, I looked at some other dates in here because I know that we could divide this period up. I'm going to get rid of these arrows here. I'll just make a line here. Um, that we have here prior to November 9th, we have 777 days. And, and so the interesting thing about this one is um, we have this period of time from the 10th day of the 10th month in 2010, and it leads us to uh, this date. So this is going to be September 23, 2017. And this is going to be 2520 plus 19 days. And 19 days, 19 is a symbol of a metonic cycle. So I thought that was interesting, that if we look at this period between this center date that's now created between... September 11th and November 9th, it, it adds to this structure with symbolic numbers. Now that is interesting in and of itself. And so we said, well, if we're looking at this story, we should then place the line of Jephthah starting at November 9th. So, but this also gives us some other information, right? So we got... Uh, 911, but we also have 119. So this leads back uh, to the study that Dwight was giving us to some degree. This idea of these 119s and these 9s, 11s, and, and, and different numbers. But if we go back, we know we have 11989, and the period of time here is going to be the period of darkness. Now, what's this period of darkness, this 18 years in the story of Jephthah? Right? When we look at the story of Jephthah, and we go Judges chapter 11. Um, now, before we go to Judges chapter 11, we have the Philistine and Ammonite oppression. So we have the story of Tola and Jair, and then we have this story of this Philistine and Ammonite oppression, and that's in Judges 10, verse 8. We could actually go back to verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, the god of Assyria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served not him. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year, they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, all the children of Israel were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. So we have this 18-year oppression in the land of Gilead, right? So this 18 years, this oppression is mentioned here. Now we know from 1989 to 2001 is how many years? Okay, so this is 12 years here? Right. Okay. And then how long is this period? 18. Okay, this is 18 years. Okay. So we're going to say that all of this history here, there's this 12 years, there's this 18 years, but we're saying that this line is going to begin here. This is going to be the time of the end. Does that make sense to people? So we have actually altogether 30 years here. Right? Now, if we look at this period, this is 30 years, but it's not exactly 30 years. Because you're going from, or pardon me, it is exactly 30 years, I shouldn't say that. It's exactly 30 years because you're going from November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019. So it's exactly 30 years. It's not an approximate period of time. 
And, and this period of time here is, is how it's 18 years, but it's not exactly 18 years, right? So how many years is it? What, what, how would we approximate this? It's, it's less. Is it more than 18? Okay, it's slightly more. So you're going to say September, October, November. So it's 18 years plus two months, right? And then on this side, this is going to be 12 years less two months. So, so. okay, makes sense. So altogether it's 13 years or 30 years. <clears throat> now we have Jephthah, and, and we're going to come to some of these, these things that we use to build this line. Um, so this helped us start the line of Jephthah here, marking the 18 years as the time of repentance. Okay, so, so this is the period of darkness, but they're going to repent. So I need to illustrate this story a little bit better. So what ends up happening, they're going to, they forsook the Lord. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He sold them to the hands of the children of Ammon for 18 years. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was sore distressed. So the, the children of Ammon are going to cross the Jordan and be fighting Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and and then it says, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites? And he says, um, um, You know, I'm, why would I deliver you at this point? Right? Because you have forsaken me. I will deliver you no more, he says in verse 13. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mitzpah. And the people and the princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So we have this, these periods, these two periods, the 12 years isn't mentioned here, but we're saying that this is a period of darkness. And then we have this period of repentance, beginning with 9-11. And so that 18 years symbolizes that. We're not saying there's 18 years that it took for them to repent, but we're saying that that's what's being symbolized there. And so we start in verse 11. Now Jephthah the Gileadite, Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot. So we're going to find here that um, Jephthah is the son of a harlot. He's, he was thrown because Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit it in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. So they're taking this message of Jephthah, because remember, Jephthah is a message, and it's being cast out, but they're going to fetch Jephthah when, this, when all of this happens. It came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel, and they're going to call Jephthah. They're going to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tov, that is the land of good. And then they want to make Jephthah a captain. They want, they want to make him their leader. And the way that we understood this is this has to do with the message of July 18th. That is, the message of July 18th, was it cast out of this movement as illegitimate? And what did we then, did this movement then call back to have the message of July 18th 
become the prominent message in the movement. And has that ever happened before? Can you think of something like that where you have a message that is rejected by the leadership, but then called back to be the primary message of that movement? I think that is a strange occurrence. Right? If you think about it, it's, it's not very common. Once you usually, usually cast something aside as worthless, and it's being cast aside not so much because it's worthless, but because you have these others, these other messages that seem legitimate uh, trying to take over. But we find, of course, they aren't really legitimate. But the message of Jephthah is the message of July 18th that comes back into this movement. So we can see, if we're going to start here at 11.9, that this is going to be the point where the message is going to be called back, right? And we know that's the case. Okay. So this gave us some information regarding that. Now, in this story, Jephthah is going to uh, defeat, and there, there's lots of stories here. So first, he's going to defeat the children of Ammon, right? And he's going to make this, uh, what they call the tragic vow, Jephthah's tragic vow. Um, so that's another story, another narrative, which can be examined. And... Uh, then we also know that he's going to um, have this debate with, um, and I always get this story confused, because this debate is going to be um, the king of the children of Ammon. And so Stephen had a, addressed this. This is the 300 years of Jephthah, where they're going to go back. And so... What Jephthah says is, why are you fighting against us? Why are you come to fight in, in our land? And, and the king of the children of Ammon is, is going to go back to this old history and say, well, you took our territory. But he's saying, well, you had lots of opportunity and you didn't have the territory at the time, right? And and that you had 300 years in which to recover that territory, and you didn't. Okay? So that's basically the discussion that goes on. <clears throat> and then, of course, he's not going to listen, uh, but they're going to have this long debate and discussing it, and it's in uh, verse uh, 26 of chapter 11. While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aurora and her towns and in all the cities that be along by the coasts of Arnon 300 years, why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? Wherefore I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. And the Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearken not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. And the Jephthah is going to make this vow. So he's going to say, look, if you're going to uh, deliver us from the children of Ammon or really deliver the children of Ammon into mine hand, that's verse 30 of chapter 11, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. And Jephthah is victorious, right? God delivers the children of Ammon into his hand. There's a great slaughter. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months 
that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. So now we have this two months. I mean, it's kind of interesting. There's this 12 years minus two months or the two extra months over here. Whether that symbol connects to this or not, I do not know. But it is interesting there as a symbol. And then what's going to happen is the Ephraimites, who have had conflict before with their brethren, uh, they're going to quarrel with Jephthah. And the men of Ephraim, they're going to war against Jephthah. And here's what they say. The men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon and didst not call us to go with thee? Were they called? Right? They were. Right? But they have this, this thing going where even though they're called, they say they're not called. Well, what are they? Okay, so what are they? What is it that they're doing? Are they opportunists? What, what is it? What? Okay, they're rejecting a message, but they want to look like it. When the message is victorious, they want to join with it, right? So they're opportunists. And Jephthah, Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were in great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that you delivered me not... I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? And Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And Gilead took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites and it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, let me go over that the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? And if he said nay, then said they unto him, say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Right? So here we have this story. Now, the key to this story was this word shibboleth. So if you think about people who are called by a message but reject that message but want to get in on the coattails of those who have accepted it, are they going to be able to understand the message? Are they going to be able to pronounce the message? They will not, right? If you ask them to say shibboleth, they only say sibboleth, right? They're not acquainted with the message. They didn't heed the call. They rejected it, but they still want to be serve. Uh, they still want to benefit from the victory. Yes. Okay. So. You're referencing here to Judges 12, 6, right? Uh, yeah, 12, 6. six. Okay. It's kind of interesting because Sister White, in letter 44 of 1903, makes the direct statement, those who cannot give the plain shibboleth, those who know not the meaning of the ministry of godliness, God cannot accept whether their profession, whatever their profession may be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a message that we have to be able to frame and pronounce correctly. Yes. Okay. So, so this became a key. Now, one of the keys I addressed this morning, because the Hebrew word for shibboleth, the, the Hebrew number, the Strong's number, is 7641, right? So we have this number, we have shibboleth. It's the Hebrew number, 7641. Now this number is interesting because notice it goes from high to low, and these are the numbers 
of Capricar's constant. Not in the order that it is. To get the order, we just go 1, 4, 6, 7, and we subtract them, right? So we're going to have 11 minus 7 is 4, right? You're going to have 13 minus 6 is 7. You're going to have 5 minus 4 is 1, and 6 minus 1 is 6. So this is Capricar's, oops, Capricar's constant. Right? That's what this is. But notice, we have this. This is kind of where our attention was really addressed to Capricar's constant as this, this symbol. We, we knew about it earlier. We had looked at it earlier. But here, we started to recognize it. And remember that this occurred in the time of Alexander, the number of days that he reigned, which I can't remember the order. I know it was four. I think it was... 4167 or 4176, something like that, the number of days. So, so we have this number, Capricar's constant, but that's not the end of it. We have here uh, something interesting. If I take this number, 7641, right? So that's Shibboleth. And I take this other number, Jephthah, which is 3316, and I add them together, I get this number. Now, what is this number, 10,957? It is 30 years to the day. That is, this is the number of days. Now, over here, you're going to have, trying to remember the number, 4324, four, I think it's something like that. Um, there's the number of days here, it's going to be left over. But from here to here, this period of time here, this 30 years, is exactly 10,957 days. And that's very precise. Now, we know the 30 years, right? From 11.9-89 to 11.9-2019, that 30-year period is the period for the priests. Yes? That, from 11.9 of 89 to November 9... From 11.9 of 89 to November 19th of 2019 is 10,967 days. How did you get that? Days between two dates. Did I write the wrong number? You've got 30 years and 10 days. Oh, okay. So, but it's not. It is, um, I'm just going from memory. So, we have... Ten thousand nine hundred and fifty seven days and you did it where? How did you do the calculation? Doing the calculation using a website time and date, days between dates, entering November ninth, nineteen eighty nine, with an end date of November nineteenth of two thousand nineteen. Oh, nineteen. But we're not it's ninth. Eleven nine okay. <laughs> I thought you'd said 1119. No, nope, 119. Okay, then you are correct and I am incorrect. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I looked at it many, many times, so I was puzzled. Yeah, so this is 11919. That's where you're getting the 19 from. Right. It's the 19th year. So this, now, when we say it's exactly that, if you, if you do the math and you multiply 30 times 365.25, you'll get... 10,957.5. So that means some years, if you're going to take any two dates between 30 years, it shouldn't be some years, it depends which, I guess it depends which years, whether the, where the leap years are, you'll sometimes get 
one more day than that. But in this case, if you count from here to here, it's going to be 10,957, as you can attest to, since you had the 19th being 67. Okay, but thanks for that. It, it's good for people to test these things out for themselves. But this is pretty remarkable. We would have to agree that this is precision. That if we take this story and how God led us, what's important is how God led us in understanding this line. That we first had a line, but then we looked at the symbols in the verse, and the symbols in the verse pointed us to November 9th, 2019, and then this pointed us to this date between these two dates, and then this Shibboleth and Jephthah led us to look back to this date, which begins this whole structure. So you have to see that this is God's hand in this. This can't be simply something contrived because we didn't contrive it. It happened. We already had those dates. Now somebody, if I had, you know, taken this, added it together and say, we need to find a 30-year period and and then created this 30-year period, that would be more contrived, right? But this 30-year period already existed in this movement. And this division here already existed, and this is witnessing to it, giving us this symbol. So there's no way that this can be contrived or manufactured by man. This is God's hand. <clears throat> so there's all kinds of things that we can see. And in... And on the second page of my notes for Jephthah, I have this chart that has a bunch of symbols in it, and I'm not going to look at all of them. And I do have the calendar converter dates in there too, so it shows the 10,957 and the 6633 and the 3316 and 3317, if you're counting from the beginning of that date. And uh, it shows the 7640 because it's, it's an inclusive count in this case. But if you put them all together, you get those numbers. You get Jephthah and Shibboleth giving you this period of 30 years. And it's using Capricar's constant, this symbol, 7641, which is an iteration of Capricar's constant, 6174. Now, the line itself then is we have the 18 years of darkness or the 12 years of darkness. This is a darkness of aversion towards time setting of any kind within Adventism. So when we create this line, we're saying that Adventists, and I, I probably should have done that 12 years of darkness, not 18. But here we have this period. Adventism are, Ad, Adventists are adverse to time setting. And for good reason. Because can we set the date for the second coming of Christ or the close of probation or the outpouring of the latter rain or the Sunday law or any promise of special significance? No. No. But... God uses time. I believe it's part of the watching and waiting. And we look at time in our own personal lives. We look at time within the movement. We look at time within the in prophecy itself and chronology. And these are witnesses of Palmoni, the wonderful number. So at 9-11, there's going to be 18 years of darkness um, because... In this movement, we are, we're not time setters, right? But we're going to come and we're going to set a date, November 9th, 2019. <clears throat> um, and so what we're going to do is create this line the way that we understand it now. And we're going to look at the different dates that are there. So... I don't know how much time I have. I've used quite a bit of time here. 15 minutes. So I can, I can create this line for you and just uh, talk about it. Okay. When it comes to these truths that we understand, 
if people saw how they unfolded, they would be much more convicted about them. They would see how we didn't anticipate what was going to happen. So here we have this period of time. And we're going to start then at 11.9. 11, 9, 19, right? And um, we have this period of repentance. We have the 18 years of darkness. Uh, we have that 10, 10, 10 in there. Right? That's 33, 16 days back, you know, from here. Leads us to that, Okay. And then we have the 30 years here from this other 11.9, the 10,957 days. And then we have an increase of knowledge, as in all lines. I'm not always drawing this arrow here, but the increase of knowledge. And the increase of knowledge here is going to be the light on the Levitical chiasm on January 11th, uh, 2020. And then we're going to have this um, first presentation that Jeff does on this. And that's going to be, and the verse that we're going to use here is Judges. So I, I need to put the verses here. This is Judges um, 5 to 10. This is Judges um, uh, 11, 5 to 10, I should put. 11, verse 5 to 10. And this is Judges 11, verse 4, and this is going to be Judges 11.11, 11. and this is going to be, um, I'll put the dates down here, so do it like this, first angel formalized, first angel empowered, first angel arrives, and then the dates here I'm going to put on the bottom, we have the January 11th date. 2020, and then March 31st, 2020. So March 31st, Jeff is going to do a presentation. Jeff's first presentation after this, where he explains the Levitical chiasm. Right. So this is an important point here, this Levitical chiasm. And then also, Judges 11.11 11 addresses um, Mitzpah. So what is Mitzpah? What is this Judges 11.11 11 here for? This is going to be the arrival of the second angel. And we're going to put this as June 22nd. Uh, 2020. So that's going to be the proclamation in, in the Tennessean that goes uh, worldwide. And we're going to put Mitzpah here. What's Mitzpah? The watchtower, right? This is the warning that's being given. So in Judges 11.11, 11, we have, um, Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mitzvah. So we're saying that these are all the words being uttered before the Lord in Mitzvah. Right? This is the Tennessean. Okay? That's the worldwide proclamation of what's going to happen in Nashville. What we believe is going to happen. <clears throat> And then we're going to have, with this, we're looking at this message, this message here. This doesn't have July 18, 2020 in this line, right? It has this proclamation because we make this proclamation. The problem is that the movement is going to be unhappy with it after the failure of July 18, 2020. And we're going to have then the second angel formalized and then empowered. And here... We're going to put the meeting of October 30th, 2020. That's where Jeff is going to write his directions to them what to do. 
but he leaves everything in their hands. That's the committee. And this is going to be represented by the 300, year, the 300 years because October is the 10th month times 30 is 300. So this is going to relate to those 300 years. So this is the negotiation that's going on with uh, the king of, of the children of Ammon. And then we're going to have uh, December 6, 2020. This is the shibboleth. Right? Now, maybe there's other ways or better ways to explain these things. Right? But this, this is what we have. Um, now, we know that this is uh, uh, the shibboleth as a symbol is, um, and I'm just trying to look at what I did here. Ah, I see. Okay. So we got this 12 verse 6. So here we have the symbol of 126, and that brings us to 12 verse 6, because 12 verse 6 is where it's going to say, um, say now shibboleth, right? So you can see how I attach that shibboleth. So that means in order to continue in this message, you have to be able to frame the word correctly, right? You have to be able to say shibboleth. You need to understand the message if you're going to move on. Now, when I say understand, I don't mean understand in every single detail and the depths of it. But you need to understand what it is that God is doing and how he's leading us. Because I don't understand everything about the message. And I don't expect that people are going to as individuals understand, but the movement is understanding this message. This movement is accepting this message. It needs to be able to pronounce shibboleth and not sibboleth. So, I know I went over a little bit, right? But we get the point. So, We've already shown that 9-11 and 11-9 are the same way, Mark. When applied to the arrival of the second angel in the line of Jephthah, we are primarily marking 11-9 as the arrival of the first message. It is then formalized on January 11, 2020, when Jeff recognizes what Jan Daniel Fontenot is pre presenting on that date. Completes our understanding of Daniel as applied to our lines. On March 31st, he presents the understanding. The first message relates to acceptance of time as a symbol, while the second message illustrates its rejection by FFA, right? Now, we're not really addressing here the third message, per se. We have this other date, June 22nd, 2023, which I haven't addressed even in the notes. Um, so that's, that's a date that's already passed, but we believe it's a symbol. It's just, and it relates to the other line that we had. Okay. So hopefully that is helpful. I'm asking people to continue to study these things on their own. I know with the people in other time zones, when I present these, you're asleep, which is great. You need your rest. I'm going to need some rest too while you're watching these videos in the morning. Um, and some of us are going to be studying these videos over a long period of time. But the point that I want to get across is that if God is in this, if we can see God's hands, we need to study it and we need to correct it. Because I'm not saying that everything that we did is correct. I'm just saying that there is enough here that we should be able to see that this is not of man, that this is of God. And I'm looking forward to hearing from other people what they have found, and I'm looking forward to being corrected in the parts where we are in error, because I know that we have those parts. We want to be corrected. We want to know the truth and understand it. And when we're corrected, we're going to see things that we couldn't see before. So can you join me in prayer? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. We know this is a powerful message, but it's hard to understand at times. We know we need to be able to say shibboleth and not sibilant. We know that we have to frame to pronounce it correctly. That is this message.
that the gospel, the truths of Jesus Christ, of God's word, need to be lived out in our lives, that we can give a testimony that we have been with Jesus. And I just pray for those that are struggling, that have doubts in their mind, that they can spend the time with you, that they can search things out. And Lord, we pray for the meetings ahead over the next few days. We need your wisdom. We need your spirit to be poured out. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.